Do you like my shirt? Well, I can't say I don't, can I? That'd be really out of order. It's, yeah. it's one of those bootleg shirts. <laughs> How are you doing today? Uh, I'm all right. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah? Really good. I got to tell you the story before we start the interview. It's a really funny story. When I was in high school, I got I got the uh, iPhone, the voice, seven inch. At that time, I was living with Skip and Karen. I was telling my roommates, I was going, I, I really hate this seven inch. This is fucking heavy metal. This is not punk. I give I give it away. So man, that was a long time ago. I I got so angry at that empty set that I found the voice seven inch. I was to get so angry because it was so different. It was so different. It was so metal. And Why then are you angry. But well, this is in high school. I was in high school. So so I got all angry. I gave that seven inch away. So as the year went by. Many, many years went by. I loved it. I loved it so much. I told my, I was a four, I think it was like five years ago. I don't know how many years ago. But I told my band members, we got to cover that song. I fucking love it. It took me so many years to get used to it. I fucking love it. So we covered that song. Then, then your new album came out. I looked at it and go, what the hell? This is all the fucking colors. This is shit. Yeah, I don't know. I know. I said, what the fuck? It's in colors. I, I'm sorry, I gave it away. <laughs> I got so angry. It's fine, man, it's fine. I, I got so angry. What the fuck? I'm so used to seeing stuff black and white. Oh, it's, no. all, it's all computerized. That's <laughs> why we did it in color. That's why we did it in color. <laughs> and it, it was all computer, because I'm so used to seeing, what do you call it? All of doing original art, art and everything. So, okay, from that booklet, let's go with this first. You had, a, you, you had a heart attack in Sweden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. W was this on tour or? It's, uh, in the middle of the gig. <laughs> you had a heart attack in the middle of the gig. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I want to ask you this, though, because you practice healthy lifestyle, vegetarian, I mean, vegan or vegetarian. All these years, right? Am I correct? I'm not healthy. I'm not as healthy as I'm, you know. I'm not like, you know, I do like kind of mess about it. I'm not uh -huh. I'm Mr. 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 Jogger, you know. But yeah, I know what you mean. And would I still say, had a heart attack. Is that what we're going to say? Would you say because of all the drug use in the past and the smoking and drinking, that probably caused a heart attack? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it made a pretty big contribution. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, that's, that's so. That is, yeah, that's crazy. Year, year and a half ago, I had to do a CPR, actual um, mouth, -to mouth to mouth breathing, to a person who had a heart attack. It was like three times bigger than me. EMT right. came yeah. in, and everything with the AED, that person passed away and stuff. Right. From heart attack. Yeah, it, it was wow. I was just shocked to hear, especially uh, somebody who's a, uh, either, I'm sorry, did you say you're vegan or vegetarian? I'm kind of vegetarian and a kind of a crap vegan every now and again. Yeah, yeah, somebody with that diet who doesn't eat meat, I was kind of shocked somebody like that will have a heart attack. So I was thinking, oh, maybe it must be all the drugs in the past. Or heavy drinking and, and smoking. And I'm really a heavy drinker. I mean, I, 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 I probably, I suppose a binge drink, that's what you call it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. We'd got there, it was a festival, we'd got there like a few days earlier. Uh -huh. and we just parted a little bit and obviously we got too much, you know. And, uh, wow. Was, we it was okay. a rubbish attack, I mean, it wasn't even a very good one. Uh -huh. All right, um, Scruff has a message for you before I start the interview. Scruff from Hell, Hell Bastard. Uh, I talked to him yesterday. Stop wearing Adidas track shot. Because what is Adidas track shot? Track suits. I don't wear Adidas track suits. What's he on about? Yeah, he says, Scruff said that stop wearing Adidas track shoe. Because, uh, Nick, 
Big Arm from Oxford will beat you up. I know, Mick. Yeah, but I don't wear Adidas tracksuit. I don't know what he's talking about. What's he on about? I don't I'll know. I wrote exactly what he told me. I, I did a track show, sh track shoot and stuff. Are you talking fucking nonsense? I'll get back to him on that. Okay, so I'll back back to that um, thing, the heart attack. How long were you in the hospital? Uh, about three days, four days, something like that. So, so what did the doc doctor say? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I was out of it. I mean, basically, they chucked me in an ambulance, oh. thrown me through the woods, straight into hospital, straight into operating theatre, loads of morphine, and uh, they just went went to me straight away. Oh. I had a stent, and um, I was just really out of it for most of it. I woke up the next day, and it was like, surrounded by all these machines and stuff, and uh, got told off, basically, for misbehaving. <laughs> Did the doctor say, like, do walks, walk around more, or stick yeah, to... Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a whole thing, like, when I, when I got back to the UK, I had this whole rehab thing uh -huh. where I had to go and do this, that, and the other. And I'm not a jogger, do you know what I mean? I'm not one of these guys that kind of gets up in the morning and, like, you know, does a fitness regime or anything like that. But um, And it was weird, because I think a bit of me sort of resented it, you know. It's like being told to do something when you're at school and, you know, you've got to do this now. And uh -huh. So I was, bit, I was a bit kind of weird about it. But, um, yeah, kind of, uh, I've changed a little bit, changed my lifestyle a little bit. So are you back to 100% now? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Or whatever percentage I was at before, anyway. All right, that's really good to hear. Okay, um... We're going to talk about your new album and some of your writings and stuff. But before we do that, we're going to talk that later on. The most important question I want to ask you, what happened to Tim Andrew, my favorite singer, Tim Andrew? Did he, did he, why did he leave? He, Tim had family, a big family. Uh -huh. uh, there was quite a lot of pressure on him to kind of take care of him, basically. Uh, and I think it kind of, I think it sort of like hit the fan for him when we were out in the States the first time and he was away from his family and he'd never really done that, not with a band anyway, before for any length of time. And I think, um, I mean, people don't realise, I mean, you probably do because you've got your own band, but like, you know, you, you, you end up putting quite a bit of time into this shit, don't you, you know? And I think for him, it was just... He had to make a choice between, you know, looking after his kids and his wife and, like, making sure they were all right or devoting more time to the band. And he just, he went with what most people would do, I think, you know. Oh, okay. Okay. Then, um, Lo I saw it on your website a while back. Lawrence left and wrote some kind of interview, right? Uh, Lawrence what, sorry? Lo Lawrence left too, right? Lawrence. Yeah, Lawrence, um... It's kind of a weird one with Lawrence, really, because Lawrence was the guy that I'd been in touch with the whole time from when we split in 87. And we've always been quite close, you know. Um, and we, we always said, before we got back together, because I used to get asked loads of times, and we'd, we'd talk about it occasionally, and it was what we always said was that we, we wouldn't do it unless we thought we could do it well. Mm -hmm not be a fucking nostalgia tribute fucking band or any of that kind of stuff. We just didn't really appeal to us, you know. Um, and at the time when we reformed, I think, like, both of us had, like, plenty of time to do it, and that's why we ended up doing it. But I think as time went on, his life got more complex in other areas. His sister became really ill, and he had a lot of stress that sort was of going on. Okay. And, uh, and it sort of affected how he was with us as well. He, he didn't seem to be kind of enjoying enjoying it. He, he'd get quite sort of tense and stuff before shows. And it was like, you know, you sort of wonder, what, why are you doing it? Because you, you really don't look like you're enjoying it. And uh, we came to doing stuff for the album. Um, and some of it was kind of already written and bits and pieces. And, and he, he kind of... 
he couldn't really put the time in to working with it, working on it. And um, in the end, it was like, you know, I, I, I needed help, you know, basically, because I was kind of doing everything. And I, and I, I kind of, I had my own shit, you know. I had my heart attack thing to get over and, like, you know, stuff in my own life. And I kind of needed him to kind of give me a bit of a hand with it as much as any, any, anybody else. And he kind of couldn't. Um, we, did a, we did this free New Year's Eve show in a, in a bar in London, and uh, he couldn't do it. So we got John, our old bassist, in to do it. And, uh, yeah. and it kind of just changed the whole dynamic of it. Uh, he had this kind of enthusiasm and uh, I don't know, it kind of put things into perspective with Lawrence really because he just he, he just really seemed to be struggling with it and, and, I, uh, and I spoke to him a few times and sort of said, look, you know, do you, do you want to do this? Do you actually really want to do this? Because if you do, I can't do it on my own. I need, I need you know, help sort of thing. And uh, in the end, I think it was, at the time, it was just, too much for him, and he just decided he couldn't do it. Really, okay. it's unfortunate because we love lovely bugs. I really love Lawrence, but it's kind of um, people have lives, don't they? You know, outside of bands, and sometimes they take over. Right. Um, I just to let you know, I did a part one interview of Antisa with the original singer, so we already know the history of the beginning from the In Darkness album. So after the In Darkness album was over, uh, what made you want to uh, start Antisec uh, back up again? How did you make it? Uh, in the 80s oh, or yeah. now? Oh, no, no. We're, we're starting from the, from the 80s, from 86 or 85, when you, when you, oh, yeah, 1985, when you um, restarted the Antisec. What made you want to restart it in 1985? With the, getting Tim. We didn't restart it. It was it was already there. It was going, you know. It kept going. Just member less, members left it. <clears throat> and we we had various various things went on with various people, and a lot of people came and went. And uh, the band was always kind of there. We didn't we didn't actually stop, you know. Oh. Okay. Just, some people seem to think we did, maybe, uh -huh. for own reasons. But it, it you know it's always carried on. We 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 did. Record and stuff all the whole way through. Yeah, yes, you are right because Pete left the. I mean, um, Richard left and Pete left. The so Richard was to leave, uh -huh. um, and then shortly after Caroline was asked to leave, and yes. then Pete goes to leave. Okay. Basically, but, um, after that, John came on board, played mm -hmm. bass. Um, and it's just, you know, something that you, we'd, I'd always done. Uh, Polly, a drummer, had always done. And, and we just didn't even think about stopping it, really. You know, it's just, okay, this is what we do now, you know. Out from the Voice Seven Inch came out in 1985, right? Mm, yeah, I think so, yeah. Is it true there's a second recording of that during that same time? Yeah, we, we recorded it twice. The first one was just fucking awful, really awful. <laughs> um, we had, well, there's a whole thing with Endangered Music, the label at the time. They gave us money to record it. We were basically, like, a bit fucked up. We were kind of squatting and, like, the lifestyle's a bit sort of chaotic, you know. We were probably taking too many drugs and piss arsing about, stuff like that. So we got we got a budget to go in and record it the first time. We just made a complete pig's ear of it. It was just terrible. And uh, we thought, well, we can't let that go out. <clears throat> so then we went back in and did it again. And uh, it was a little bit better. But, I mean, to us at the time, it still sounded a bit rubbish, but it was the best we could do. So, yeah, there is there is another recording kicking about, but I don't know if anyone's got a copy of it. I haven't. And is this, I heard it while back, in the 80s, the Antisic did a recording for Motorhead Records, Complex label. Yeah, yeah. It was all instrumental without the vocals. 
Does does that still exist? Could we still hear it? Or who has a copy of that? I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, I mean, basically, we 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 spoke to Conflict about doing the album, about doing the second album with them. Uh-huh. We started doing it, and it was around about the same time where we were all kind of like a little bit screwed up one way or the other. Um, and we'd be, we had studio time. We laid down backing tracks for, for stuff. Um, and as kind of time went on, it was around about the time when the scene was kind of changing in the UK. It was kind of weird. It was like things went from being kind of optimistic and kind of um, kind of an up vibe to a bit confused and a bit um, nihilist kind of thing. And that sort of affected us. When we, when we play the gigs, the atmosphere of the gigs kind of changed. And that sort of changed how we sort of felt about it. Definitely how I felt about it anyway. And I think when we started doing the album, we we'd kind of, we didn't really know where we were musically with it. <clears throat> so it seemed like what we're, where we were going was a lot different to whatever else was about at the time. I think that's made us think, well, are we doing the right thing or whatever? In the end, for want of a better word, we just we took too many drugs at the wrong time and just fucked it up. Wow. I do remember this. I don't know which member it was. Someone from Antiseg wrote a letter to Maximum Rock and Roll. It was a really long letter saying that um, the rumor wasn't true. I'm still alive. Just oh, that who, yeah, I'm sorry. John the bassist, John Bryson. Oh, that was John who wrote that long time ago. Oh, wow. Okay, I was all always one, wondering that. Then I was going, wow, what the hell? Also, on the booklet, you mentioned about you were hitchhiking and, and you had a sleeping bag, you sleeping in bus shelters and and stuff, or sleeping at bars. Was that during anti sec or before anti sec when you were going to shows? Both. I mean, everybody was doing it, you know. That was just how how the scene kind of developed. I mean, we've hitched to our own gigs. Uh-huh. You know, Wait, so you guys would take sleeping bags to shows, gigs? Yeah, yeah. That was just how it went. Wow. You know, you'd go to see bands, you'd, you'd, just, you'd, you'd follow bands around, and, like, no one had any money, so, like, you know, you couldn't get on a train or a bus or whatever, and you'd just, you'd hitch. Hitchhiking was for, like, fun quite big really in the UK then in sort of mid 80s and you could right. do it I mean you could get stuck places and it wasn't it's was pretty horrible sometimes you would piss down the rain or something but you know you could do it and it was just a whole little group of people kind of like met each other like that you know when I mean, you're talking about Scruff and uh, Oxford Mick I mean that's how we met you know just kind of hitchhiking up and down the country you'd see the same faces at the wow. same station and stuff like that, and you just get to know each other. People that had a similar kind of idea about it, you know. And people would actually pick up punks when they hitchhike. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> Even with the whole crazy. Year. But the you, trick was the trick uh-huh. was to have a girl with you. I'm sorry? Just, the trick was to have a girl with you. Oh, okay, okay. It's two guys, three big scruffy looking guys. You ain't going to stand much of a chance. But generally, if, 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 you, if you had a girlfriend and your girlfriend was with you, then uh-huh. that worked out, you know, they sort of figured that you weren't that threatening. Oh, wow. But that doesn't happen anymore in England, do they? Does it happen still? People take sleeping bags and sleep sleep outside and stuff? Or? Uh, no, not really. I kind of cold, sort of cultures kind of changed. Uh-huh. Does it not happen in the States? Do you not ever do that? <sighs> I don't know any, anyone in Los Angeles who, who brings a sleeping bag to a show. No. <laughs> would you know? Would you not know people from LA that would like hitchhike to a gig in I don't know San Diego no. or like somewhere like that? No, LA has a good. Um, LA has buses, uh, metro, train, and everything. And plus, if somebody's at shows, they don't have a place. They will always say, "Hey, you know, I, I can somebody give me a ride, or I need a place to stay." They will say that and. They will take bands and, and stuff, but if if it happened, nobody told me anything about it, so I I have no idea. So just wondering because that 
the scene was so different from Eng England, the 80, 80, 80s to here and stuff. So speaking of um, different, what did you thought about after all these years? And we, a couple of years ago, I actually talked to you at Manic Relapse Festival, remember? Yeah, yeah, briefly. You had a broken leg, I think, didn't you? Yes, I, I broke my leg from ju judo class. <laughs> it, was, it was a judo class, but I'm 100% now. I could run and everything. Actually, that broken leg got stronger. It, it got, like, much stronger than my other leg. Because I've got a arm at the moment. I'm waiting for that to get stronger. But, so, what did you thought about the whole um, punk scene now, when you played at the Manic Bird Labs? Was that surprising you, or was it different then? Uh, it's kind of a weird one, really, because, I mean, that was the second time we'd been to the States, obviously. Uh, and, you know, I think... We're a bit different, you know, to most of the bands in the scene, I think, because we're older and we're kind of like, we've probably got a slightly different attitude, I think. And I think that probably comes across, you know. Um, certainly with like a lot of the bands we played with, you know. There were very few bands, I think, that I felt that we were on a similar kind of wavelength to, if you know what I mean. Well, I think a lot of that's just got to do with the fact that we're, we're older, you know. We, and our scene came from a slightly different time, maybe. Um, the Manic Relapse thing, the festival was, was cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I love stuff like that anyway. I, I just like chatting to people and getting amongst it, you know. It's, it's good and kind of seeing what, what people's different scenes are, you know. One of the best things about being in this band is that, you know, we can travel around and... and you get a really kind of an interesting perspective on like what goes on in other places and you know the sort of the good things and the bad things that happen and, and the things that you just you wouldn't hear about otherwise you know mm -hmm. so, yeah it's good in that respect punk scene wise fashion politics what changes have you seen from the 80s to now including politics and the fashion the way we look and everything um I'm not too bothered about the way people look, to be honest. I mean, I'm, I know we used to look a bit crazy and stuff, but the more important thing is what you think and, and what you do and how you act. And uh, it seems to me, and I've said it before, I'm a bit sure that, like, compared to how the scene was in the UK, which is all I can go by at that time, that oh. early 80s, uh, most of the scenes that I've I've kind of been involved in this time round haven't really been as politicised. I, I, I get the feeling that like kind of there's more emphasis on like, what the band sounds like than what they say, um, and I, I it's not a criticism because it's people coming from different ages and different times and people go through different uh, feelings and different kind of. Um, sensibilities as they get older uh -huh. but I, I kind of like I've been a bit surprised that like a lot of the politics of it hasn't kind of moved on as much as I expected it to still what what kind of um it kind of bugs me a bit I suppose is that it's become it's, it seems like it's become an, in, an insular little scene where you know punk for want of a better word you know punk hangs around with punk and if there's an attitude there and if there's something to be said then it seems like it's not going much beyond that because the scene itself is like so kind of closed knit and um and my my thing really is is to convince people that don't agree with you that you've got a good idea uh, while you stay in a in a peer group, you're only talking to people that pretty much broadly kind of agree with you anyway. So you don't expand that idea, and uh, and that was always a thing that, that excites me. And I'm I'm not sure if the punk scene has, has got that somehow. Well, you know, maybe it has. I mean, I think there's probably quite a few old, older people that have like, you know, that don't still do the same things that they did. 20, 30 years ago, but they'll still, still promote that attitude and still, you know, diversify into other areas, you know, art or whatever. 
But um, as far as the gig scene goes, it, it doesn't, to my mind anyway, it doesn't, it hasn't really developed as well as I, I thought it might. Also, I, I noticed some of your uh, fans, anti-sick fans from America. I don't know too much about UK, America. Like they became um, well-known vegan chef, put out cookbooks or became school teachers. Yeah, and, that's cool. And did anyone from England like, you know, or like change like that, like in a career? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I got involved with a bunch of people called the Punk Scholars Network. Mm-hmm. So it's basically a uh, bunch of people that are kind of involved in like the early earlier days of punk that are like now university lecturers and like things like that. And uh, they kind of maintain that kind of attitude and they're, they're, they put together this little network of people. They have like conferences and stuff like that, annual conferences. They bring people together from like all around the world and just discuss various aspects of punk and what it means. Um, you know, how to broaden it out, people's perceptions. And I find that kind of, that's really kind of stimulating. I remember when you when you mentioned to me about coming to Oakland, about Antisect coming to Oakland last year. Yes. Um, I kind of, I think I mentioned to you then that we couldn't come as a band, it just it cost too much money to come, you know, for, to one gig. Mm-hmm. But I, I was up for like coming over and just chatting and stuff. Oh, for the anarchist gathering. Yes, yeah. I remember. In Berkeley, Berkeley yes. Yeah, because I think in, in many ways you get, it's easier to get ideas across uh-huh. in that sort of environment than, you know, a band jumping up and down on stage and playing loud music, because most people, let's be honest, are kind of there for the music. Uh-huh. And the politics of it tends to kind of get a little bit lost, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we like to mix things. That's what the anarchist gathering we have. Um, yeah. Speakers, workshop, band. So it could be fun, and it could also be educational, just to like balance it out and get everyone all together and it's stuff. Good. It's good. It's good. It's good. I mean, but what I would say is that, is that it's. Um, I mean, have you ever thought of like trying to? do something like that with people that might not be punk. Right. You know? Actually, I, I, I forgot to tell you this. Um, at the gathering, we, we had a, a workshop and stuff, too. Uh, the, the day after, it was about mental health and stuff. Some of the punks, as they got older, they became counselors. Yeah. Or, like, doing all these different things. So... I mean, they don't look punk anymore, but we say, let's bring them in, let's bring them in. A lot of people don't know they're punks who are doing this. That's right. It's excellent stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's how things move forward, you know. And I've noticed, you know, people that I knew back in the 80s that are now in completely different positions, and they have the opportunity to influence people in different ways. Uh-huh. But like, you know, someone jumping up and down on the stage can't do, for instance, you know. It's, it's, I'm it's sorry. diverse, you know. I love all of them. The workshop, jumping up on stage, the music, yeah. everything. And the whole site there, I love everything. But the thing also I, I want to ask you was this. We'll get back to, back, back to the thing. I was reading the article. I was really shocked. Um, you got hit, smacked with the um, police, police um, stick and trampled on a police horse. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, did this happen at a protest when this happened to you? A few different things. Protests and animal rights stuff. And uh-huh. it's just, it's just kind of how you were treated, really, back then, you know? It was... So to people like in authority, we were just scumbags, you know, dirty scumbags. And we were dirty scumbags, but, you know, we were dirty scumbags with a conscience and a point. But yeah, that's that's the kind of thing that used to happen. It used to happen to loads of people, you know. It's just how it was. Were, were like protests really dangerous in the eighties in England back then? Um, I wouldn't say dangerous, but there were the you odd know, incident, you know, that get out of hand. I mean, same as anything, you know, you get you might get a bunch of police that just would lose it, uh-huh. and go for someone or go for a group of people, and like you know there were. Definite times when it was a bit of free for all. Yeah, because I was shocked to hear that you got your face hit with the 
Klee stick on the face. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just shocking. So that's all I want to ask. Also, you also mentioned about getting a gun pointed on your head. What, what was that story about? Yeah, that wasn't a demonstration. That was just something else that happened in my life. That was just a, a weird incident. In, in England, right? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. thought guns, guns were illegal in England. Uh, they are, kind of thing. Uh -huh. just people get them. And, and you also, on the book that you write, you had a motorcycle? You were riding a motorcycle? Yeah, the ride bikes. I've always ridden bikes. It's, that's my thing. Oh, wow. Interesting. Even in the 80s, you rode bike. Yeah, yeah, we were well into it. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, crazy. Cool. I can't picture you with that long hair riding the bike. <laughs> Well, that's, right. end, that's actually why I ended up cutting my hair off. Because every time I turn around, because I had locks, uh -huh. you try and put helmet on with locks, and you turn around and you just get whacked in the face with your own hair. I just got pissed off with it. So I, I just ended up cutting it off. Wow. Well, they put that in England too, right? Mandatory to wear helmet right, while riding by motorcycle. Wow. Yeah. I was on my friend's scooter many years ago. We crashed. After that, I said, no way. I'm not getting on any scooter or motorcycle. I, I got, like, seriously hurt. It was in a rainy day. That's why I was going, wow, that's crazy. I always trip out on punks, like, who ride mo motorcycles and stuff like that. Okay. Now we're going to talk about your new album. Mm -hmm. I, wanted, I wanted to know... Um, there was a couple of my favorite favorite songs where Tim Andrew used to sing. Um, it was the Welcome to the New Dark Ages, and there was other wow. What's that other song? I I forgot the title. There was another song you guys did in the eighties. You put in the album. Do you remember the title? And you, you guys the, changed the lyrics to it. It's on the new album. Yeah, on the new album. It's on the new album. Uh, it's probably called Acolyte on that. Yes. Which is the one that kind of used to be called Ritual, and then we changed yes, it such so time. Ritual, yes, Ritual. That's my fucking favorite song. The lyrics. And yeah. how come the lyrics lyrics got changed on that? On the uh, because when we were rewriting it, some things kind of make more sense now than they did then. Uh -huh. Some things like you know you'd look at something. I mean, I'd look at something that I'd written. Like I mean, you got to remember that was that song was written. In, 1986, something like that. Uh -huh. You know, you look back and, and, you, and you think, I don't think like that anymore. So it's, it'd be wrong to kind of put that mm -hmm. right in, in some Just, of the residential you now, you know. The thing is, we used to have a uh, live cassette, cassette tape of that. And of course, there's bootleg vinyl of that live from the 80s, but none of them had lyrics. So like, it was really hard to sing along what Tim was saying, something like, is he saying, war is over, war is over, we die? What was the actual lyrics for the old song? What was he saying? Something like, well, well, uh, it's I'd, over. I'd have to take that out. He says, we die. Well, that... it, we couldn't sing along with it because there was no lyric sheet, and we had to rewind it. What is he saying? But it sounds really fucking good. But then I was reading the new lyrics. <laughs> Write your own lyrics. Right, right. Then we're reading the new lyrics on the new album. I was trying to see, I was thinking, wait a minute, that's not how it went. This has changed. <laughs> What's going on? And stuff. So, yeah, you got to move along, you know. Okay. And the other questions I had, something to hate. It was was this about the ex-band member? No, it's, it's about... Um, it's about people that kind of um, can't move along. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of people. I mean, we found it this time round that, like, you know, people were really cynical about us getting back together, and they thought, well, oh, you know, they're doing it because they want to make money and all this kind of shit. And wow. you know, people people are really quick to criticise somebody that does something without actually doing anything themselves. You know, it's an, it's an easy day, isn't it? It's an easy targets. As soon as you put your head above water, you get shot at. You know, that's that's the deal. And it's it's a song about people that, that like to criticise but don't actually offer anything positive themselves. You know. Oh, so it was for people like who just 
who slides off, but they don't do anything. They don't make anything. They just complain all the time. Am, am I correct? Sort of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's very easy to criticize. It's very easy to be negative about things. It's very easy to be nihilistic, you know. Uh-huh. But it's a, it takes a little bit more to kind of offer something in in return, you know. Okay, we all know we all know the world's a shit place. We don't need to be told. It's pretty clear, isn't it? You know. But what's what's what takes a little is to sort you can keep better or throw some optimism out there if you can find any, you know, and just not say how bad everything is. And and in particular, what's kind of weird is like when when people kind of criticize stuff that's obviously trying to do something good. Uh, There's a lot of that, you know. It's like left-wing politics is kind of weird. Right-wing politics, people don't give a shit, you know. They just want to get rich. They just want to fucking do what they want to do. They've got no social conscience, nothing. So they don't, there's not very much arguing there. Left-wing politics, I mean, my politics aren't left-wing. They're a bit different, but people tend to, like, want to be, you know, the the best vegan or the, I'm a bigger anarchist than you or, you know, this, that and the other. And and you get these petty fucking arguments that just defeat the whole point of actually trying to take something somewhere. Is that that England? Uh, is that everywhere, everywhere that I've seen. Oh, okay. It seems to exist in, in some people that either, I don't know, I mean, it might be wrong to say I haven't got the imagination, but, but haven't got the wherewithal or, or don't want to contribute something. Oh. It's not easier to kind of just criticise something. And I don't just think that's fucking boring and, and not very good. Yeah. Right. I have to ask you this. I, I have a lot of respect, especially from the 80s, what the whole anarcho punk movement did in England with all the bands and all the stuff you guys did. But now what what's more sad now is your um ex band members and stuff um posting stuff online, posting like on unofficial anti sec and stuff. Yeah. And then I want to bring this up because there was I was reading it and stuff, and they were saying that um, you ripped them off on in in darkness. There's no choice album. Um, is that loads of stuff? Loads of stuff written about me. What I'm supposed to have done. It's but the vast majority is just a load of shit, basically. I mean, a, I can tell you the whole story of all of it, and it's 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 all you know. This is from the horse's mouth, you know. I mean, if you want to hear the story about the the in darkness royalties and you know where it begins is, is back when we first did the album you know we did it in 1982 1983 um there were six members of the band um some members contributed a lot more to that album than others did others contributed very little um but at the time you know we're, we're kind of we've got this kind of anarcho kind of attitude um Everybody gets the same thing out of it. Yeah, whatever. Fine. I mean, I don't really give a shit about money anyway. Um, and <clears throat> I think, from my point of view, I, I kind of thought, well, it'll work out. In the great scheme of things, it'll work out. You know, it's, there'll, there'll come a point when someone will pick up, pick up the slack and, like, you know, do more work than I would or whoever would. And it, over time, it just sorts itself out. Um, but what kind of happened is it didn't really sort itself out. You know, there were, there were things that went on in the band uh, that some people haven't really mentioned that kind of made the band go a certain way. Uh, people being asked to quit the band for various reasons. And I won't, I don't really want to go into it, but I will if you want, if you want me to. It's entirely up to you. It's your interview. Um, um, yeah, it's all right. I mean, but uh, um, as time goes on, you know, and the band changes and band members come and go, etc., etc., etc. So first time around, everybody that everybody that was in the band at the time of that album, everyone got the same money, no problem. Um, 
I think the, the, the thing that you're referring to is like much later on. Um, basically, I found out that Southern had re-released it on CD. Um, someone came and told me about it, and I, I, I thought, well, oh, that's a bit weird, you know. No one contacted anybody, so I, I called them up, went in to see them, and they said, um, "Oh yeah, you know, we, we re-released it. Oh, we've got some royalties for it." Blah, 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 blah. So this was, I think, what kind of year it was, but it was kind of before mobile phones, and you know, everyone had gone their separate ways. No one, no one was in contact with anybody anymore. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I, people did some things to me that I just didn't really want to hang around with them anymore anyway. Um, but anyway, the upshot of it is I was put in charge of the royalties, the royalty. Um, and um, I sort of kept it. Again, we like a couple of grand, I think, to start with. Uh, and I put it in a bank account. I thought, well, if I heard about it, you know, someone else is going to hear about it and someone's going to get in touch with me and then we'll figure it out. Time went on, nobody did. Nobody showed up. I didn't know where anyone was. I knew oh. Holly had gone to Sweden. Uh -huh. Didn't know where anyone else was. I knew that Wink, the bass player, was dead. Um, and I was stony broke. I was squatting in London. Uh, I didn't have a job. I just started spending some of the some of the royalty money because I needed to. I needed to fucking eat. Um, time went on, and it just it went. You know, I just ended up kind of spending it. Didn't feel great about it. Felt a bit shitty about it, to tell you the truth. But I didn't really know what else to do. You know. Um, so time went on. I mean, I suppose we've got to go from net from then until when we reformed the band. Um, and I thought, well, I can't, I can't really let it sit like this. It didn't, I felt shit about it. So when we, when we discussed reforming the band again, I mean, there's a whole story behind that. Um, I was kind of, I'd lost touch with everybody. I kind of contacted Caroline here and there. I left, I, I, I kept in touch with Tim and Lawrence, we've, we've always been good friends. Uh, we had, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you know a guy called Timmy Hefner. I'm sorry? Timmy Hefner, do you know him? From Austin? He, no. uh, I, I'm he, not sure. I, I think I'm right. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. He's a guy that used to organize a festival in Texas. Oh, oh, yes, yes. The big festival, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. And he kept emailing me. So I asked me to, if I wanted to reform the band to play the festival, and I kept saying, oh, I can't see it happening because, you know, I've lost touch with everybody and, you know, it's just not going to happen. And he just kept on and on and on. Uh, and then I started talking to Lawrence about it. And we kind of like, first of all, we just thought, no, it's ridiculous. We can't, we can't do that, you know. Neither of us had the time to do anything and we didn't know where even was and et cetera. And then... Timmy just kept banging on, and eventually I, I, I got in touch with Caroline and uh -huh. mentioned it to her and said, look, would you be into it? Would you be into doing something if we could get it together? And she said, yeah, of course you would. So I said, well, how, do we, how would we go about doing it? You know, She told me there was people that she didn't want to really see again that were involved in the band. There were people that I didn't want to see again that were involved in the band. Um, and I kind of said to her, I think she'd been in touch with Pete Boyce, like an email or something like that by that time. And I said, well, why don't you ask him, if you're in touch with him, ask him if he's interested in like, so getting, getting it back together. Because my, my kind of thing was then, I thought, well, it'd be really good if we had like people from different times of the band. You know, we had like Caroline and Pete and me from like the early days. Then, like Tim and Lawrence, we didn't know where Polly was a drummer. I, mean, I doubt if he'd be up to doing that 30 years later anyway. So, we found a drummer, Joe Burwood, that used to work with me here. Um, 
So Caroline kind of mentioned it to Pete, and Pete said, yeah, he'd be up for it. So I went to see him, uh, chatted about it, and I sort of told him, you know, what my ideas were for it. And, uh, you know, he, he seemed like well on for it. Um, bear in mind, at the back of, at back of my mind all this time, I'm thinking, shit, you know, I've, I've done this royalty thing. I've got to, I've got, I can't let this go on like this, you know. Um, so I kind of said, well, let's, let's all get together. We got together in this hotel in Northampton. There was myself, Caroline, Pete Boyce, Tim, Lawrence, and Joe. Maybe Joe wasn't there, but we had a chat and we all kind of cleared the air about who we wanted to be involved and who we didn't want to be involved. And uh, we decided we'd set up some rehearsals, or set up a rehearsal to see how it kind of went, and we did that. Um, and some of this will probably know, but I'm just trying to fill in sort of background to it. Um, it was a bit, bit, bit of a crack rehearsal, it was a bit dodgy, but you know, we sort of thought, well, you know, it might be okay, it might be okay. Uh, so we thought we'd organise some more. And by that time, I just thought, like, I've got to say something here. I can't let the royalties thing kind of carry on. So I, I spoke to Pete and I said, look, you know, this is what's happened. So I did this, I did this, it's done. I can't do anything about it. Um, at that time, Southern kind of got wind that we were talking about getting back together again. And uh, they called me up and they said, well, you know, if this is happening, then maybe we can re-release in darkness. And, um, you know, would you, would you like to remaster it and write some new liner notes and stuff for it? So I thought, great, you know, I'll do that. I'll remaster it, I'll write liner notes. I said to Southern, look, you know, this has happened with the royalties. I don't want anything from this. Count me out of the royalties and just give it to fucking, give it to everybody else. Just try and kind of, Bring it back around somehow, but I'll, I'll remaster it. I'll write the notes, etc., etc. Um, so that was kind of in the pipeline. Um, and obviously, I, I told Pete what was going on. I told him that you know I kind of I had that money and I couldn't do anything about it now. But this was my way of like if I could kind of correct it, and this is my idea for how to correct it. I don't have chunk of money in my pocket <laughs> to give to people. You know? um, and at the time he said, his, his own words were, I'm not bothered, I'm not bothered. So, okay, well, whatever, you know, we thought well, that's how it would go. Things got complicated um, in a few different ways. Um, we had a guy who also wanted to re-release in Dallas. Uh, he approached me about it, and I said, well, I've been talking to Southern, and um, I need to kind of, well, you know, I need to go and speak to them to see what the deal is with this, with the ownership of it. The Southern weren't the original label. It got handed to them from Spider Lake, the original label. Um, he said, oh, they don't, they don't own it. They don't own it. I can do it. And I said, well, let me go and talk to them and kind of clear it up. So I went to see them and they were 100% adamant that no, you know, we own this record. You know, no one else can do this. We own this record. So I went back to him and said, it's, you know, pull it off. You can't do it. You can't do it. Otherwise, you know, there's going to be big shit from Southern. Just don't do it. He told me, oh shit, I pressed up 2,000 records sleep. Oh, okay. Uh, so I said, why? You know, you jumped the gun, you know, you shouldn't have done it. Kind of thing. And he said, well, fuck, I've done it now. Let me, let me, let me just run off, you know, enough money, enough, enough records to make enough money to get my money back. And then I'll, I'll delete it and we'll sell it to like, you know, DIY outlets and stuff like that. And at the time, it was like, fuck, man, you know. He's kind of put us in this really weird fucking position. We were trying to get the money together to get to do the American tour, and, and he said, "Look, if you let this go, I can give you give the band like fifteen hundred pounds to go towards the cost of like funding the American tour." So we kind of we all discussed it, 
outside here, actually. And uh, we kind of agreed, OK, well, we'll let him do it. And he said, if anything happens, you know, you just say that it was nothing to do with you. Of course, two weeks later, I get a call from Southern saying, what's this bootleg thing we found? Uh -huh. So <clears throat> I go to see Southern, have a talk with them, and basically you have to kind of come clean and say, look, you know, this happened. This is the deal. This is a one-man operation doing a bootleg thing. He's adamant that you didn't own it. Uh, you say you do. He jumped the gun. Now he pressed up all these sleeves. And we're kind of stuck in the middle. We've taken money from him to do to go towards his tour. But I don't really want you to sue him. This is just he's just a, a guy on his own. Your your Southern Records with a lot more clout. You know, and, and it's a fuck up, basically. It's a fuck up. Um so I sat there with just three southern reps basically giving me shit for about two hours. And I said to them, okay, well, look, if you, if I can convince you not to sue him, I'll go to the pressing plant, I'll get the sleeves, I'll get everything that's anything to do with it, I'll bring it back to you, and you can destroy it, you know, on the basis that you won't sue him. And they said, okay, do that. In the meantime, um, there was a whole load of stuff going on with Pete. Um, we were rehearsing. Uh, he was kind of getting a bit fed up with the rehearsals. Um, we'd done a couple of gigs and, and he kind of, Tim was getting kind of frustrated with him because he was kind of coming in at a long time and like sort of forgetting his words and stuff like that. So, you know, we were kind of getting a bit frustrated with it because he didn't seem to, either be able to or want to put the time in to kind of, kind of get it what we thought it should be like. Um, so he, he kind of he stopped sort of coming to so many rehearsals. He actually said to Tim one of the occasions when they were driving down one of the rehearsals he came to, that, you know, if they think I'm going to come down to London and rehearse every couple of weeks, then, you know, fuck that, I'm not doing that. So the rest of us were in this position where we kind of we wanted to do we wanted to do something good. We didn't want to be a shit fan. You know? um, so we come up with the idea we just we'd do some recordings here at the studio. We put them on SoundCloud, he could download them and like work his stuff out up there so he wouldn't have to come down to London. He could do it in his own time and it would be a, kind of a workaround way of kind of Get things kind of sorted. And we thought, you know, that was that would kind of work. Um, in the meantime, I think he sort of disconnected from us a little bit, you know, because he wasn't in the rehearsals. And like when we had the rehearsals, we'd all sit outside for like an hour or so before the rehearsals, just talking about what happened in the, since you know between now and the previous rehearsal. They're like, okay, this this person's email, this person wants us to do this. This is going on, blah, 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 what should we do about this? So he's kind of not party to half of these conversations. And you're trying to move forward and you're trying to get things done with someone that seems reluctant to involve themselves. So we talked about coming to America. Um, one of the things about coming to America was that we were going to be out there for about three weeks or so. And... Um, Tim, Pete, and Joe all had jobs. Uh, myself and Lawrence have got jobs, but our jobs kind of, if we're there or not, we can still get a bit of an income. Okay. So it became a bit of a deal where we thought, well, we're going to be out in the States for three weeks. We've got three three guys in the band. This is this is after the Caroline incident, which I've come to in a minute. We've got three guys in the band that can't afford to just go away for three weeks and not have any, any wages, you know. So we asked everybody what, what they needed. Uh, and Tim said, you know, he needed like 140 pounds a day when he was out there, that's what he would earn. Pete said he would earn 100 pounds a day. Joe said he would earn 100 pounds a day. So we added all that up. We got this figure, like, shit, this is what we need 
to be able to get together if we're going to be able to do this tour. Everybody wants to do it. So part of the thing was any money that we got from gigs, we'd just shove into this kitty and that would go to get the airline tickets, pay people's, people's wages, etc., etc. And then obviously we'd get money from gigs, but not enough to cover that amount of money. You know, well, we didn't really know. We'd never been to there. We didn't know what to do. We just wanted to make sure that everybody was kind of going to be all right. Um, and then Lawrence, for his company, Lawrence is a financial controller. Um, I didn't want anything to do with any fucking money because I, I, I was just, what I'd done before, I just didn't want to be accused of again. So, so I just thought, I'm not, I'm not dealing with the money. I don't want to deal with the money. Um, I'll deal with setting things up. I'll email people. I'll talk to people. But when it comes to money, I don't want to be the person at the end of the night holding a hand out for the fee. I don't want anything to do with it. I just want to do my thing. Let someone else take care of it. No one else offered to do it. Lawrence offered to do it. Where he worked, they had um, some system where they could convert currencies so we could get money for European gigs, convert the currencies without losing so much on them in the conversion. So he kind of took charge of, like, looking after the money that we got. Now, I think somewhere along the line, he assumed that something weird was going on with me and Lawrence, that we were hiding money away or something. I don't know. Well, that's what I do think now, because it's obvious it's come out. And basically, what we were trying to do is just get the money to pay all their fucking wages for this tour, which we couldn't have done otherwise, because they couldn't have afforded to go. Um, and I went up to see Pete, um, because we were all concerned about, you know, look, we're going to do these gigs, we're going to go to America, blah, 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 we want to be good, you know. Uh, I said to him, look, you know, this is shortly, he had a hernia, he had a hernia operation. We had this gig in uh, France scheduled. It was like something like 1,500 euros or something for the, for the show. And that was going to go in the pot, you know, to, to fund all this. So I went to see him and said, look, you know, we want you to come to do this gig, but you've just had a home you know. Obviously, you're not going to sing full ball, but we want you to come along and maybe just do some bits and pieces if you think you're up to it. Um, and he... I was said, yeah, you know, okay. Uh, first of all, he thought, I think he mentioned it like we pull out of the gig, but it was only about two or three weeks before the gig was due, been advertised, etc., etc. He said, well, you know, two reasons for not pulling out of it, really. One, because it would kind of fuck things up in France, you know, we suddenly just pull out. And two, you know, if we want to do this tour in the States, we need to, we need to get this money to, to throw in the kitty towards it. Um, and I thought he understood that. Uh, I also kind of said, look, you know, from here on, you know, can you, can you do a bit more? Can you get a bit more input? Because, you know, you're sort of falling behind the things and you don't want it to be like that. And he, you know, we had a couple of clients and all seemed all right and we got the car and I drove back to London. Uh, and then the next day, I just got a volley of texts from him, basically calling me manipulative and, you know, I was trying to steal money and Lawrence was like, he did cahoots with me and we were trying to do this and do that and I forced Caroline out of the band and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and it just went on from there. And then, you know, for the last eight years, it's just been this constant fucking character assassination for me, you know. Right. Um, I mean, he, he claims that I forced Caroline out of the band, which is, which is just fucking ridiculous. When, when, when we first got back together, even the first time around, the reason Caroline came into the band is because we thought it'd be good to have a female perspective in the band. And that's what I thought the second time around. Regardless of the fact that I'd, I'd been in touch with her, and, and you know, she was one of the first people around when we were talking about it. 
I like that. Um, but when we started to do things, Caroline, Caroline's not a writer. She doesn't write. She's not really a singer. Um, in the first time round, I, I used to write the stuff there. I used to write the little poems and the little things that she did. Because I had the time to do it. This time round, I kind of said to her, well, you know, it became obvious after a little while that there wasn't much room for her to do stuff because there was nothing written. And I kind of said, look, I, I can't, can't fucking do it this time. You know, I've got, I'm trying to do umpteen other things and I just haven't got the time that I had in 1983 or whatever it was to, to write other write stuff for you as well as organise everything else and do, do everything else. And she was a bit kind of like upset because I know she wanted to be a part of it. And I wanted to be a part of it. I think everybody did. And um, I said to her, well, look, just write something. Write something. And like, you know, if you're not confident about it, just bring it to us and we'll, we'll all chuck something in and we'll try and improve it or, you know, get it what, how you want it. And, you know, she insisted that she couldn't do it, she couldn't do it. And I sort of said, well, you can do it. Of course you can do it. You know, and, and if you do it the first time and it's rubbish, you'll do it better the second time and you'll, you'll do it better the third time. And that's, that's how everybody does it, you know. Because she used to do poems a long time ago, right? In life. I used to do poems, but I used to write them for I love, I love that, yeah. Yeah, and, and, it, and it was really good. It was really good. And it was a really different part of a set, you know. Right. And that was, that was the idea this time around. But, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I just couldn't write it. I didn't have the time to do it. And um, so, yeah, you know, I put it to her and it didn't really come. And then she sent me something and she said, oh, you know, this is crap. And I said, it's not crap, you know. Look, why don't we do this, do this? You know, if you think it's crap, let's make it better. Let's make it so you so you feel confident. In it. And then um, she she emailed me and just said, she can't do it. She doesn't want to be in a band anymore. It's not how she thought it was going to be. Those right. were words. And, um, and that was kind of the end of that, you know. But ever since, I keep hearing about how I, how I kicked her out of the band. And I was the only one in the band that actually tried to help her do anything for the fucking band. You know? That's really great. But I'm, I'm sorry for bringing this up. The reason I brought it up, because it, it was... I have an anti sick tattoo on my chest, and it was embarrassing seeing that unofficial page and all these negative. But I, I noticed that you never responded to any any of them, which is good too. At the same time, that was good, but it was going on and on. It made me sad to see that. That's why. You know, I mean, for me, you've got to understand being on the other end, being on the other side of it. I'm just getting all the shit, and, and Lawrence was as well. And Lawrence had nothing to do with any of it, and and. On the edge of it, so was so was Joe, and you know, when Pete started putting all this, this we'd sent to him on YouTube. It was like, you know, you're, if you're trying to get at me, you've got, you don't have to get at Joe, you don't have to get at Lawrence. It's nothing to do with them. Leave them out of it. If you've got a personal beef with me, then yeah, take it out on me. But like, it's not fair to to do this to other people. And I, and at the time, I just thought, I don't want to enter into a fucking online argument about something like this. I wrote to Pete, I wrote to Richard, I wrote to Caroline, I wrote to Polly, I wrote to all of them and said, look, this is what I did. This is why I did it. And, and like, I'm quite happy to meet with all of you, you know, and we'll talk about it like fucking adults. And, 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 I, and if I can find a way to make it up to you, I will. And I thought I had when we come up with the idea of giving them the royalties for the for the re-release of Darkness. But because of that that stupid page, some of them just freaked out. They didn't want to get involved in the shitstorm, so they pulled it. It didn't oh. come up. So that would have been their chance to have got something back. But because of all the shit they were throwing at me, it kind of didn't happen. And, and you know, what was most disappointing was that I wrote to them all and said, Let's talk about it. And not one, not one of them replied to me. And said it was just this ongoing barrage of fucking psychotic weird bullshit, you know. And there's no way, like, since everyone's older, there's no way everyone could just sit down and just at least make a friendship. There's, 
not like that happening or anything like that. Without that's where I'm coming from, I, that that's always been my thing. Uh-huh. You know, but, I, I'm a talker. I like I like to, if, if there's a problem, uh-huh. you talk it through. You don't run away from it. And you, right. you don't run away from it and start swearing at the person. Do you know what I mean? You, you, if you've got an issue with someone, you figure out what it is and you deal with it. Uh-huh. And kind of what happens is that people seem to make this fucking scenario up in his head and then convince himself that that was right and then just went with that and, and enter into any kind of like conversation with me about it. Everything I got from him was like, you're this, you're that, or you're the other. And it's just like, no, man, you know, there's a whole other side to this that you just not, you, yes. you don't want to pay attention to. Because you know? this happened to another band, I'm not going to mention the name in England, an ex-member was saying stuff, but it was really sad to hear this because these are the men who talk about social change, caring, and everything. But what I'm yeah. trying to yes, what I'm trying to say is, do you think sometimes, um, like the act? I mean, do you think sometimes we focus way too much on music? We focus way too much on the band. We lose what we're fighting for. We lose what was in our heart. Do you think that's why too this kind of stuff happens? We focus so much on music. So much in the band, we forgot what the reason the reason why we started this, the reason the social change, the love, <laughs> everything. Do you think because that's, that's why sometimes a lot of these band members, I mean not just anti sad I'm talking about other band members. A lot of band members have this kind of problem with ex members, bands who yeah. see vegetarianism or anti war or anything like that. I agree, I agree totally. Yeah, focus was too yeah. much music. People go through lives and people change, don't they? You know, some, well, some people change and some people don't, I suppose. One of the, one of the weird things about, about this whole scenario, I can only talk about what I've been involved with, I don't know about other bands, but there were things, my, what was in my head when, when, when I wanted Pete to come back in the band was, I remember we used to write together, we used to go to the library to write together, we lived together for a bit. He was a member of the Peace Pledge Union. You know, we both went on like, you know, demos and marches and stuff together. And that was the side of him that I remembered. That was the side of him that I knew. And and when when he came back into the band and we were trying to get it this all together again, he, he wasn't the same person. And I think there was a bit of me that, you know, Maybe being around people that were still thinking like that would kind of make something click in his mind, uh, but but it didn't. It, it quite obviously didn't. I mean, there was just some really uncomfortable incidents here and there, you know, outside the rehearsals when we were chatting. Yeah, just like things things that were said that you just think, you know, this this isn't. I wouldn't be standing here having this conversation with this person unless we were in this environment, you know, unless unless we were trying to be in a band together. And it was a bit like that. It was, it was kind of like but sort of painful. But I don't know. I'm a fucking I'm a bit of an optimist, you know. I, I like to, I like to look for good in things rather than bad in things. And I I kind of thought that it would kind of work out, but it just didn't, you know. Okay. So, all right. Woo, man, I gotta breathe now. That was that was kind of hard to handle. It's like a real sensitive thing, and I, I was getting sad reading all this stuff online in public. Cause that's why I have to bring it up, because people could hear both, people could hear both sides. They, they, that's why the part one interviews and part two interviews and stuff, so we can understand. But so I, I have a lot of respect for you. I have a lot of respect for Pete. Uh, ex anti sect members, new members, and, and everything. I have respect for everybody. The weird thing about Pete for me is that I, I, I saw the interview that you did with him, for example, and you know, I've had plenty of conversations with him, and, and there's a whole side of him that he's just a fucking good guy, right? Pretty straightforward, pretty honest. But there's another whole side of him which I've I've experienced. It's like 
adds two and two, makes one, and then just goes fucking psychotic about it, you know, and, and I just don't think that's a good way to be. I think you, you've got to, you've got to try and kind of acquiesce with people and try and sort of figure out why you feel how you feel and, and work it out as opposed to just being completely kind of tunnel visioned about something and I'm right, I'm right, I'm right and I'm not listening to any other kind of side of it, it's kind of disappointing it's, it's weird <laughs> you know? so so, <laughs> so when you, okay, you know my reason I, I want to tell you something funny, you know why I have the sunglasses on sometimes um, when I do interview I was really like because certain band interviews I do, we talk about funny stuff. We talk about serious stuff. I've been reading about human, uh, what do you call it, body languages, face expression. I'm not going to mention names because some of the uh, interviews I do, some people talk about real serious stuff, and it makes me sad. I don't want to show that sadness. <laughs> but some, I'll some talk of, funny old shit. Don't worry. You can talk about any old No, no, no. When I was near Pete, I have a lot of respect for Pete. I, I love Pete. I feel a lot of sadness when I was interviewing him. By looking at his face expression, I could tell, man, he had a hard life. He must have had a hard life, but went through something hard and stuff. It's some of the books I've been reading about humans, body language, face expression, the eye, and stuff, and stuff like that. But okay. yeah, okay. thank you for sharing all this. But like I said, I have respect, a lot of respect for ex anti sec members, new anti sec members. I hope all this online stuff thing stops because when the kids read it they was like, what the hell this is the band like talks about social change and you're posting this online like doing this and that like you know it's like let's get one thing straight though yes there is a man here talking about social change uh-huh right, right? There's, there's, there is a band that's talking about social change yes yes there's there's something else yes. that's backbiting against that band Right. It's not, the band aren't creating an issue here. We just do what we do, you know, whether you like it or not. You, know, you might not you might think the last album's crap or whatever, but we just do what we do because we have to do it. I, that, that's what I've always done, and I can't stop. You know, I'm, I'm not going to... Yes. I don't really want to get tied up in a, in a petty argument about something. I've got right. things that, that inspire me more than that, you know? But I, I do, I have to tell you, I have to give you credit for that. I do like that attitude about you. You don't go on social media and just blah, 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 get back and stuff. You just keep doing what you're doing. You just focus on what you're doing. I, I do like that. Isn't that what we should do? Though? What, what, what is the point? You know, what yes. Is the point? Everyone should do that. Use their energy to do something good and stuff. Positive. <laughs> All right. I, I want to, okay, thank you for explaining this. This is kind of scary. Me. I want to move on now. Going too deep in here. It's, you're scaring me now. <laughs> That's all right. Well, we'll, talk all right. About, I don't know, we'll talk about elephants or something. I don't know. I don't mind. Now, with this tour that you recently did, how 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 did the audience, including the old anti anti sec audience, how did they respond to some of your shows and tours? I mean, I mean, when I first saw it with um with you, Lawrence Tim, when I saw you live, I was going fuck. It's amazing. I love it. It's fucking good. But I had a big complaint about your banners <laughs> because they were they were computer computer print. I was like, man, it's so good. But why is the banner all computer print and stuff? Not a computer print. I mean, like professional. Oh, print. It's okay. cheaper to do that. We haven't got the time to paint paint our own banners anymore. Do you know what I mean? Uh huh. But go and get stuff like that done for like twenty quid. I mean, I used to paint our back in the day and I'd paint them on the floor in my bedroom and I'd oh. pick the banner up and they'd be like white paint all over the floor in the bedroom. Can't do that now. I'll get shouted at. <laughs> what kind of response did you get from the audience? Though? What, from about the old, old anti-sec fan and the new fan? No, for your performance by watching the, the anti-sec. Um, I, it, well, it was kind of weird, I think, because I think the first time we went, there uh -huh. were people who'd never seen this before. And, and there was all that kind of vibe about it, you know. Um, the second time we went, fair only one, it was like six years later. Six uh -huh. years, long time, the steam. I mean, I think the like, first time we were together, we weren't even together for six years, you know. And that scene changed dramatically, you know, in that time. So I think the second time we were there, 
I sort of noticed a kind of a disconnect because generations of people that had come through had never fucking heard of us half the time, you know. Oh, the new generation? Never heard of you guys? Well, some, yeah, plenty of people like that, you know. We were just this band from England and this band of old guys and, like, you know, they didn't, not, I'm not saying everybody, but, you know, there was, there was more of an element of that, that, you know, we were kind of, like, separate from the evolving scene over there kind of thing. It was kind of noticeable. It was interesting because, you know, you talk to these people and, and still really cool people, but just surprised at us, I suppose, being over there doing that still then, maybe, I don't know. What about your new album? What kind of reviews got have you got from your new album? Uh, well, in the punk community, it's been pretty mixed. Uh-huh. Uh, in the kind of, more kind of, I wouldn't say mainstream, but kind of like rest of the press, it's been pretty, pretty positive, really. I mean, we've kind of did a little thing where we kind of tried to find all the reviews. We, we posted them on our website. Mm -hmm. over there. Um, I mean, I understand that, like, you know, some people are going to fucking hate it. We knew that to begin with. You know? It's like, and the reason why is that we don't want to, I can't see the point in pretending that you're still how you were in 1985 or 87. It's just, it's not progressive, you know. And, and and punk to me is a progressive thing. It's like you've got to, you, you know, you take it somewhere. You don't just say, like, well, this is my era. This is my element, and I'm sticking with it. And I'm not prepared to look any further than this because this is the perfect time. I think that's a bit that's a bit sad. And, and let's face it, I mean, back in the day, that's what punks were taking the piss out of teddy boys for right. doing. And nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, it, should, it should evolve. So... I can understand people that don't really want to evolve being disappointed that it doesn't represent what they think it should have represented, which was a period in time that's not there anymore. Do you yeah. think that, right? Do you think this happens to a lot of bands too? When when the band start, they just play like four chords repeat over and over, but as time goes by, the band members start getting really good on music, and they they open up, open up, and start play, actually become yeah. musicians. Then they lose the audience. Do you think that happens? I, can still, that? I can't play more than four chords now, man. <laughs> no, no, no. no just, just wondering. Do you think that's what, like some of the old fans get mad at because of that? Because they're saying, because maybe you get better on music no, and everything. If you play, then you want to play something that's interesting to you, don't you? I suppose. And then if you keep doing it and maybe you get better, then what's interesting to you five years on from when you started is something different. Mm -hmm. But none of our album is fucking sophisticated. I mean, I, I, I can't fucking do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not a good guitarist. I'm a crap guitarist that occasionally comes up with a good idea. I'm not someone that has evolved that I sit in the room and play, you know. I, I, and that's not the point anyway. The point is, of, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the music is like only half of the equation. Mm -hmm. The other half of the equation, and the more important part of the equation, really, is the words and the sentiments and what and what, what we're trying to push. For this kind of band, anyway. I mean, other bands, it, just, it depends what you're into. But, but as far as I'm concerned, like Onset is always about trying to, Trying to write something that's that's thoughtful and, and progressive, you know. And one of the, one of the things actually that's been quite weird is how in all the I mean, I hear things kind of like third hand, you know, from people, you know, these people are saying this and these people are saying this, and it seems to be that, that there's very little been said about the content of the lyrics or yes. the or anything, and and for me, that's that's the fucking point of the album. That was the first thing too. My my first notice was the cover, the cover, and I didn't go straight to the lyrics. Of the music. It was it was the music and stuff. So for those people who have who are still stuck in the old anti sick and they haven't heard the new album, what's the difference now on writing style? Tell me for people who don't have the um, new album, what, what would you say the lyrics are different? 
It's not really that different. They're, 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 they're the lyrics of a guy that's 30 years older than he was when the last album came out. That's all. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty... I used to kind of read the lyrics to In Darkness, you know, once every couple of years, just to see if I still kind of uh-huh. had the same kind of vibe about it. And, and you wrote some of the songs in Darkness too, right? The lyrics? Well, I wrote, yeah, at least half of the lyrics, probably a bit more. And, and, and oh, you wrote, you wrote half of those lyrics in Darkness? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Well, you know, if you read those lyrics and you read the lyrics to the new album, uh-huh. you should be able to join the dots, you know, it's, my, my, my opinion hasn't changed, my opinions haven't really changed very much, I mean, I still, I still believe in pretty much everything that I believed in when, when we, were, we were doing In Darkness. I gotta tell you something, that's really interesting, because normally, punk bands, a singer writes the lyrics, I never heard guitars writing lyrics, I, I mean, in the old days, you were just playing. I didn't, sing and I didn't want to sing, and, and and no one else was really into it. I mean, Pete was into it, so me and Pete used to write quite a lot together. Wow. Uh, yeah, that was that was just kind of how it works, really. Uh-huh. And, and now I've ended up being a singer because no fucker else wanted to do. It. Wow, is is it hard now playing guitar and singing for the yeah, same time? Great. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be all right, be good, but I'm, I'm not a good guitarist. That's what I'm saying. If I was a good guitarist, it'd probably be easier, but I'm not. No, I, I think you're good. I think you're really good and stuff. You, well, you yeah. know, people who, people who say they're not a good musician are the really good ones. I got to tell you that. I'm not, all. I'm not a musician at all. I'm just some twat that's picked up a guitar and hasn't really learned to progress very much. I know, I know what, I think I know what sounds good to me anyway. So that's, that's all I go by. Oh. I was going to ask you this too. This is after Tim Andrew left. Did Tim Andrew did a guest vocals on on your song when he came to see you a while back after he left? So um, I saw a picture online. Him we, singing. Did, uh, we did a benefit gig uh, oh. New Year's Eve before last for Shelter, okay. which is a London homeless charity. And Tim came down to that. And yeah, and he did a couple of numbers on that one. Oh, that is so cool. Can you please have him once in a while come and sing for Auntie Sick? Because I love fucking Tim. He's on Facebook. He never checks his messages. I don't think he even goes on Facebook. Oh, he's rubbish. He's rubbish like that. He's rubbish. Oh. So, so while you guys are doing, what else benefits and causes have you guys done? Um, a few. I mean, the first London gig we did was a uh, was a benefit for a, um, a kid's song. Uh-huh. It was a bring a toy thing. It was like basically, you know, there was an entrance fee. We hired, we hired this venue, a pretty good venue, and uh, we wanted to keep the door price down, but we wanted to do it as a sort of benefit for something. But then, if, of course, if you, keep, if you keep the door price down, then the benefit doesn't get very much money. So we decided the way to do it was to keep the door price down, but say to people, well, you've got to bring a toy. Bring a toy. So everyone turned up with, like, toys and we stashed them somewhere, and that got delivered to, like, the kids' home. Um... We've done like benefits for the one in twelve. I don't know if you know that place, Anchors Club in Bradford, New England. I heard about it. Yes, I heard about it. Um, we did the shelter benefit. Um, I mean, most most of our gigs in the UK have been benefits. Really, you know, it's it's kind of um, it's another weird thing about when people say you're doing this to make money. You know, a there is no fucking money in it. Uh-huh. And B, you know, if you talk to anyone that's organised stuff with us, they'll tell you that you know most of the stuff we do is benefits. Fees we ask to, to break even, that's it. It's just funny because when people see making money, I, I heard that sometimes. I, if somebody go, can you name at least one anarcho punk band that even fucking bought a car from record sale? I go, no. How about even a fucking bicycle? I go, no, I can't even name anybody. <laughs> so I can't yeah. even fucking name one band who fucking bought a car. Car or anything from from, from records. Oh, it's mad. I mean, I don't know. I mean, some people just. I think even like when we first started again, we got a good fee for doing that. The first show we did in in Finland, I think. I think we got something like. Well, we thought it was a good fee at the time, which was like something like fifteen hundred euros, plus our flights. And I think, I think maybe one of the problems with Pete and and and, and maybe Caroline, I don't know, is is. 
the assumption that that's what we get for every gig. You know, that every gig is the same as that, and it's it's, it's just not. I mean, you know yourself. That was a festival. I saw it on YouTube. That was good too. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But uh, you know, I mean, mo most of our gigs are like we all. all I mean, I I my income comes from my work anyway. Oh, what are you? I'm an engineer. I produce and this, that, and the other. You know, that's that's what I do. That's what I've always done. So the band is not the vehicle for me to make fucking money out of. I don't. I don't want it to be, and I don't need it to be. And consequently, I mean, it's different for other members. For example, I mean, Joe needs money occasionally. So every every once in a while, we kind of bump up a fee. He hasn't had any work. But, you know, the, the principle of it is that we're going to do the best thing we can do. And as long as it doesn't cost us to do it, we're game. That's that's what we say. Uh, it's, it's different, you know, coming to America, for example, because the cost of doing that are a bit more. But, you know, most, most of the shows we do around Europe and that, I mean, basically, we fly in the cheapest airlines, you know, we'll either sleep on someone's floor, I'm trying to avoid that now because we're getting a bit too old for that. I heard that crazy story when you first came to LA. A couple of you remember have to sleep on the rooftop. I heard yeah. that crazy story. First no, time. Right. It, was I mean, it was a bit weird. I mean, we were, half of us were jet lagged and half of us didn't really know what was going on. We right. ended up in time at uh, Drew's house and it was just like, they were like up for party, party, party. We were just like, you know, we, were, we were fucked. Yes, that's when, when Mark came. Remember you guys came with yeah, Mark? Yeah, yeah. Gosh, yeah. how many years ago was that? That was 2012, yeah, something. Yeah. Things changed so much since 2012. Back then, I was so poor. I was living in a small studio. You're not going to believe my life just changed with everything. Wow. Well, you moved, didn't you? From, didn't you move from LA to San Francisco? Or yeah, something? yeah I, I live in Northern California. Even job-wise and everything, it all, it all changed. It all changed, though, but. In that period of time, I liked you so much. It's just crazy. I'm not going to go into detail, but it was crazy. Back then, I lived in a small single studio studio apartment, and Mark was staying with me and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. We stayed with you before he joined up with us. Didn't we? That's right. Yes, I was so poor back then. I started reading books and doing research. I was going, I need to fucking move up. All my friends are moving up. And I just did so much research. You won't believe it, though. But that, that's a whole different story. You know, that, yes. Yes. Actually, when we were over there, it's just amazing how things could change in six years or seven years and all five years. So, when all, all this shutdown's over, what, what are your plans? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've been kind of using the time. I've been trying to trying to learn some stuff. I've done a couple of online courses and that. I mean, the studio here we've had to shut down. The social distancing and all of that. Um, but I just thought, well, try and use the time. You know, I can't go out, I can't do this, that, and the other. Then all you've got is your, your laptop, a computer, and the internet. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff you can learn from that. And that's what I've been trying to do, really. I've been trying to learn a little bit about coding and kind of web stuff and this, that, and the other, like that, which is a bit boring. But. Cool. All right, this has been almost two, yeah, this has been two hour interview. I have, I'm gonna have so many fucking editing to do. It's not gonna be ready for a while to post it online. But before we go, what kind of um, advice would you give for folks who, who are in bands and stuff? Cause you've been doing this for so many years. What keeps you keep going doing this band? Like, what kind of advice would you give? Depends what kind of band you are. What kind of what? Depends what kind of band you are. Anarcho-punk bands. Um, think about what you're doing. Challenge yourself. Question yourself as much as you question anything else. And 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 develop. Try and develop. You know, because when you're when you're younger, things are a lot more black and white. A lot more kind of your kind of concepts of things are a lot more. It's either this or it's that. And I think as you as you get older and you experience a bit more of life, you realise that there's complications and compromises and weird things that happen in between, and that because someone looks like they're like that, does not necessarily mean 
they're one of those kind of people, you know. And you can use that to communicate with people beyond your own peer group. And if you've got something good to say, then say it to people that you want to agree, that you want to get to agree with you rather than chatting amongst your friends. Expand, you know, the best. That's, that's what I think. Advice for punk rock bands, kids who want to start punk rock bands is just fuck the system and stuff. What advice would you give? Uh, get the loudest fucking amp you can. Um, <laughs> that's about it, really. <laughs> All right, advice, last one. Advice for all anti-sick band like me, who's in many years but still see stuff black and white. <laughs> Posters and flyers. Advice? You your voice? Yes, everything's still black and white. <laughs> That's short, short advice before we go. I'll see you with a color t-shirt on one of these days. <laughs> yes, for sure. You do on that, I look lovely. Long, before we go, long live anti sec all right, thanks, Sam. Don't Respect hang up yet. I'm going to stop the video. Thank you very much for, for the interview. Okay. All right. Long live anti-sick.